Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, thanks for joining me this evening, and I'm excited about this evening because it's a wonderful, wonderful time of year. Uh, I'm Don Kinsler, the NDSU Extension Agent for Horticulture here in Cass County, and I, I love this time of year. As I was driving back to the office this evening, uh, it's a beautiful evening, and I was noticing how the sun is low on the horizon, uh, lower than it was in midsummer, uh, and the sun as it gets lower on the horizon creates long shadows and the sunlight and the shadows just gives fall a totally different look than at other times during the year and it's really quite an enjoyable time you know it's it's uh, fun and interesting uh, it's sometimes a challenge to get it all done to get all of our fa uh, fall tasks done but it's it's a good time of year. Uh, if we can choose the days when they're nice and sunny and warm, then working in the fall yard and garden really is a reward. It it's uh, it, it's a time unlike any other th throughout the growing season. And so I'm sure, like many of you, I, I really enjoy this time of year. And it's going to be fun this evening. We're going to talk about um, kind of all things uh, fall related. We're going to take a walk through the the lawn and the perennial garden, uh, the vegetable garden, talk about trees, shrubs, fruit trees, uh, maybe even a little bit about house plants toward the end. So we're going to try to cover it all. And uh, as you think of questions uh, during the webinar, feel free to put the questions in e either the chat or the Q&A. Uh, most of us are probably most familiar with the chat, so feel free to put those in. And then at the end of uh, the webinar, I'll address those. And uh, so thank you very much. Um, there are approximately 76 of you joining this evening. So greetings to all of you. And the fall of the year here, I just, as, as I mentioned, it is such kind of a magical time. There are colors in our perennial gardens, in our landscapes, uh, colors that we don't see at other times of the year. Uh, a famous landscape architect, worldwide famous, called Pete Audolf, uh, created a wonderful movie a few years ba uh, back. He called it the Five Seasons of Gardening. And uh, five seasons, kind of meaning that each year flows into the next. Growing seasons flow into the next, and there are never really only four because you head on right into the next season. So as one year ends, you look at the next. And so some of the colors uh, that a person enjoys in the fall, that famous landscape architect said that in the fall, we learn to appreciate Kind of the muted tones, the 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 browns, the uh, look, look in the photo here, for example, the beautiful ornamental grasses that develop their seed heads, and there there's a richness of colors, and so it's no wonder so many of us in the garden kind of enjoy this time of year, even though we're kind of getting things ready for winter. So let let's start in the lawn. Some things that uh, that we can and maybe should be doing with our lawns, and. Uh, boy, it's been a tough three years for lawns, hasn't it? It's been hot and it's been dry, and a lot of our lawns don't look all that good. Well, September here is a great time, even though September's coming to an end, it's still a great time to get our lawn looking much better for next year. And next year's lawn is really going to depend on what we do yet this fall. So a couple of things. If you if you did need to reseed, the preferred cutoff is actually about September 15th. So uh, as we're um, doing this on the 26th here, we're a little bit beyond the preferred seeding date. And the, the reason for that is the reason for seeding by September 15th is so that that grass seed will sprout and establish enough so that it will survive winter. Uh, seeding right now could be a little bit risky. It'll germinate fine because the soil is good and warm, but it could be a little risky as to whether it would uh, establish enough by the time winter comes. So, but there is still a way, uh, unless you kind of want to take that risk, there's, there's a good way and that's called dormant seeding. And for dormant seeding, we wait until the soil has cooled down to a point where that grass seed won't sprout. And then uh, right before 
the snow that comes that would be expected to stay. Uh, so I suppose we're looking at sometime uh, mid, uh, mid November, late November, you know, however the season stacks up. But you spread the grass seed right before the snow comes and that snow will lay and protect that grass seed and it will be in place ready to go right away next spring. So dormant seeding is definitely a way that we can still fill in some of our bare spots. Now, fertilizing from Labor Day in September onward, uh, continuing throughout the month of September, so there's still time, is to fertilize. Labor Day would be the preferred. We don't want to get too late. For example, uh, fertilizing too far into October could cause a flush of tender lawn growth that might winter kill because it would be so soft and fresh. But in September here, uh, we're, we're still within that window. Um, for example, uh, at my wife Mary and I's home in South Fargo, we just got an inch and uh, three tenths uh, over this last weekend. I had fertilized around Labor Day, but uh, we don't have means really to water our lawn or water it sufficiently. So that fertilizer was just laying there waiting for moisture to, to dissolve those granules and carry it down into the root system. So we really needed this rain. And so the fertilizer that we've applied uh, in the month of September now finally got some widespread rains that will carry that nutrition down into the root system where the grass roots can take it up and make use of it. And if a person didn't get the fertilizer on yet, uh, you, you could still do that uh, this weekend, but the sooner the better so that, that grass can start utilizing the nu nutrition. And a reason why this fall, September, fertilizing is so important is this. Researchers have shown that in the fall of the year, grass is making tremendous growth, tremendous root growth. And that deep root system that it forms in September is what will carry it through uh, next growing season in the spring. It will carry it through and really uh, make our lawns recover very, 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 very beautifully. And uh, so um, if you haven't done the fertilizer yet, you know, go ahead and, and get that done. Um, and so anyway, I can't emphasize enough the importance of the fall fertilizing. For example, that September fertilizer has been shown uh, to be the single most important fertilizer of the whole year, um, uh, even more so, uh, even more so important than uh, the spring fertilizing. The spring fertilizer is very important too. So anyway, our lawns need the nutrition in the fall is the moral of the story. All right, the other thing that September is great for, and that is killing weeds in our, our lawns or really anywhere in our landscape or yards. Uh, the reason that fall is the best time to control these hard to kill weeds, such as creeping Charlie, which is the photo on the left, or thistles, the photo on the right. The reason that these perennial weeds are more effectively controlled now is, is this. Uh, these perennial weeds are busy carrying nutrition down into the root system so that they can survive winter and come back to haunt us next spring. And if we apply herbicides in September here, uh, those weeds will carry that fertilizer down into the root system more efficiently and more effectively than almost any other time of year, especially as we start getting a little bit of cooler temperatures. The cooler temperatures and short days signal to these weeds that winter's coming, and so they start storing up material. And so let's give them some herbicide to carry on down as, as well. Uh, many of these hard to kill weeds, of course, uh, one application isn't going to do it. Uh, they will typically come back, uh, hopefully in a weakened state, next May, and then that's when you would put a secondary application on. And with persistent, we can out-persist some of these hard-to-kill weeds. All right, next, uh, the important concept is to continue the three-inch mowing height all the way through September. Uh, three inches is the recommended mowing height uh, so that we get a good... Um, you know, a taller type mowing. And, and here's the reason for that taller type three inch recommended mowing. 
and a couple of reasons. One is that taller mowing will tend to shade the roots, so you get less evaporation. Uh, it keeps the soil cooler, which grass likes, uh, but also the that height gives more photosynthesis surface and when leaves uh, including grass has more photosynthesis surface that means it can produce more good stuff it'll root deeper it'll fill out sideways better uh, as opposed to if if we scalp the lawn with a lower mowing height we're reducing some of that leaf surface so you don't get as much of the good photosynthesis stuff that we all learned about in science class so keep the mowing height at three inches uh, through September. Uh, then in October, we could start reducing that mowing height down to maybe two inches or certainly no lower than an inch and a half, but two inches is probably best. So uh, in a couple of mowings in October, gradually reduce the mowing height. The reason for that is that if you continued the three inch mowing height, there's a possibility that under the weight of the snow, that uh, three inch layer could mat down more, get floppier, mat down, and snow mold might be a little uh, more severe next spring. Um, but it's important not to cut that uh, lawn too low because a lawn that's cut too low would tend to have more freeze out if we get a very severe winter without much insulating snow. Now, our friends over in uh, University of Minnesota created a great lawn care calendar. So if we look at this uh, lawn care calendar, and, and you could uh, pull this up on a search bar, uh, just Minnesota lawn care calendar, this will pop up. So it's got the task over on the left, and then it's got the best time to do it, and then an okay time. Well, we kind of like to concentrate on the best time, don't we, to do things. For example, um, seeding. Okay, early August to late September, that's maybe pushing it a little bit. Um, but, you know, if you wanted a little bit of a risk, you could maybe still seed. But again, September 15th was the cutoff. Um, aerating mid-August through mid-October. Uh, Dethatching or power raking, we can do that now. Uh, so anyway, it's kind of fun to have a calendar like that, that that we can use for our different tasks. And of course, anytime we're doing anything, it's always nice to have someone sitting there making sure we're doing it correctly, isn't it? I couldn't resist setting that slide in. All right, the next, next task is, I love this one. Uh, there's really no need to rake the leaves off of a lawn uh, because those leaves uh, have lots of good material in them. So instead of raking the leaves and removing that good material, we can simply mulch them into the lawn uh, with a few passes of the lawn mower. And if it's a type of lawn mower that kind of shoots things out the side, most of them have a removable shoot or a, a way to shut off that discharge chute so that it will mulch it back down into the lawn. Now that this photo was taken in our own lawn a couple of years ago, and it only really took about one pass there, as you can see, to grind those leaves up pretty good. Uh, so this, this has been fun. Uh, the, reason I, uh, the reason I include this uh, and the reason that I wrote a whole garden column about this a few years ago uh, was this. I saw some interesting research done by, by Ohio State University in which they studied for a number of years whether it actually was good for a lawn to mulch these leaves in. And here, here's what they found. And of course, it was easy research to do. You just have, have a couple of plots just side by side, and one you mulch in the leaves, and one you rake off the leaves. And then after a number of years of doing that, uh, assess the two plots to see what's happening. So here's what they found. Mulching the leaves into the lawn added natural nutrition as those leaves break broke down. So it tended to have a, when they tested the soil, the soil had a higher fertility. Also, the weeds were controlled better in this patch. And they also did, this was a replicated study, uh, you know, with all the good science-y type stuff done for research. Uh, also, uh, they found that the soil temperature stayed cooler, which grass loves. And, um, 
Actually, also conserved moisture. That area, that patch of lawn stayed more moist. The soil stayed more moist. So good reasons to mulch the leaves back into the lawn because it's actually quite healthy for it. Okay, and if you do have any questions uh, on lawn, uh, there was one question that I'll uh, one question that I'll address right away is before we leave the lawns. Uh, tall fescue clumps. Have you ever noticed in your lawn, you'll have these clumps, uh, kind of a circular clump. The grass is dark green, really nice, but it's a little wider blade. Uh, you know, it's not crabgrass, it's not quackgrass, but these clumps are called tall fescue. They're oftentimes a contaminant in seed, grass seed mixes, and uh, gradually they'll enlarge that clump. So if you see those, uh, in your lawn, what can we do? Well, there's only about two ways to do that, to remove those. One would be just to dig out that clump and remove it. Uh, another would be to use a non-selective herbicide, uh, grass killing type herbicide, and kill those clumps and then uh, and then reseed that area. So anyway, that's what that is, is tall fescue. And um, it especially showed up these last number of years when our Kentucky bluegrass lawns have kind of diminished. The thing that keeps tall fescue so green and vigorous is because it has a really, really deep root system that can pump moisture from down below. And so that's why when our lawns have kind of been under stress, uh, that's why the tall fescue has really showed up in area lawns. And uh, you could overseed, oh, well, we're kind of on that borderline, so I'd probably reseed those areas next spring. So you could kill those areas of tall fescue now and probably reseed in spring or do dormant, uh, sprinkle some dormant seed in those areas right before winter sets in. Okay, let's move to the vegetable garden. We're kind of winding down in the vegetable garden, but there's still some fun things because I enjoy harvesting the pumpkins, squash, carrots, onions. And now um, pumpkins and squash can be left in the garden until after the first light frost. I kind of like to do that because the first light frost doesn't hurt the squash or pumpkins, but it collapses the vines. So it's easier for me to find the squash. Uh, the way that you can tell if squash are fully ripe um, and of course there's always some late squash in the garden too but the way you can tell is uh, as photoed there that uh, kind of uh, kind of a buttercup type or a related hybrid uh, they develop a less shiny coat a little duller and also notice that spot called the ground spot on a good ripe mature squash that spot turns from yellow to more of an orange tone and also a good way to tell a uh, ripe, good ripe squash is to try denting it in with your thumbnail. If you cannot dent the rind in, uh, then it's, uh, it's, it's ripe, it's good. But if it's still soft and dentable, then it's not quite ripe and ready. I should also mention that most of the winter type squash, uh, such as buttercup uh, or the related hybrids, most of them will get sweeter uh, with a little bit of time, curing time, uh, left in the garage at about 70, 75 degrees for uh, up to about a month or moved into the basement if we start getting chilly. But the squash will improve in both texture and sweetness with um, two to four weeks of curing, it's called. And of course, carrots can be left in the garden until right before the soil freezes. Uh, carrots, as the temperatures start getting cooler, carrots do become sweeter. The cooling temperatures favor the buildup of sugar within that, within those roots. Onions should be dug as soon as the tops become dry and brittle, uh, then they should be gotten up out of the soil. Uh, potatoes could be left in the ground a while. I have not dug ours yet. Uh, they could be left in the ground. They have kind of a natural dormancy period, so they won't start sprouting yet or anything. Uh, I don't have our root cellar cool enough yet, so that's why I'm delaying our potato harvest a little bit. Uh, rhubarb can be dug and divided now in September. 
uh, or you can do it next May, just as soon as they're starting getting little growth. But uh, I remember mom and my grandmother always divided theirs in uh, September. Now, the tops of asparagus, which you see in the lower center photo, uh, the tops of those should be left on over winter. And there's a reason for that. Those tops uh, will help to catch the snow. And if we have a very open winter in which we don't get much insulating snow, those tops will help to catch what little snow we do get, and it will help the winter survival. Because asparagus, uh, as tough as it is, if we have a winter with very harsh temperatures and very little snow, it's even capable or possible for asparagus to freeze out. And of course, a little bit of sanitation in the vegetable garden. Uh, some of the crops that tend to get leaf diseases or stem diseases, blights, things like tomato, pepper, uh, squash, cucumber vine, potatoes, pea vines, those should really be raked off and removed and disposed of because some of those disease organisms can survive winter on the trash that is left behind. So th that's probably better to rake off. Other things, uh, cabbage, cabbage leaves, broccoli, uh, le old lettuce, uh, much of that can just be chopped up and returned back into the garden soil. Oh, and I love uh, I love controlling weeds in the fall of the year. And, and here's why. Because the weed control that we do in the fall can really make a lot less work next spring. For example, if we see weeds going to seed around the perimeter of our garden, you know, if, if we got tired of doing weeds and there's some that are on maybe along the fence or somewhere that have gone to seed, if we let those seeds scatter, they can seed our garden soil with a bank of weed seed that can last for many decades and keep popping up and, and give me lots of weeding headaches. So any weed control, anything you can stop from going to seed is that much work, less work next spring. And if you have any perennial weeds popping up in the garden, thistles, um, uh, quack grass, creeping jenny, anything like that, uh, now would be a good time to spray them as well. And the fall is a great time to add a little more compost uh, leaves, tree leaves raked off from other areas could be spread onto the vegetable garden. For example, if you've got excess on the lawn that you more than what you can mulch in. Um, I should mention that, um, you know, we talked about mulching leaves into the lawn. Uh, one thing I should mention is after you've mulched those leaves in, make, make a pass or two, uh, those leaves, uh, the shredded leaves can't remain on the surface. If you've tried to mulch in so many, and after a day or so, if they're still laying on the surface of the grass, those need to be raked off. Otherwise, they'll be smothering out the grass. So if you do have excess uh, more so than what will mulch down into the lawn, you could rake that off and add it to the vegetable garden. You know, it's interesting when a person uh, works those leaves into the vegetable garden, by next spring, they're pretty much uh, decayed as the leaves come in contact with the soil. All right, next we're going to head to the trees and shrub department. And we can continue to plant trees yet through September. It's a good time for planting. And here's why. You know, a person might wonder, well, is there really any advantage to planting in fall or should I just wait until next spring? Well, there is a good advantage to planting now in September. And, and, and here it is. When trees, shrubs, or perennials are planted now, they won't make much top growth but the roots will grow. The roots will continue growing until the soil gets down to maybe 40 degrees or so. And we've got a long way to go with that. So typically, if planted by the end of September, they'll have most of October, you know, that's uh, about 30 good days in which they can start producing roots. And that will put that tree shrub or perennial ahead of something that is delayed until next spring. So good advantages to doing some uh, fall planting. And evergreens should be watered. We've uh, most of the area got some pretty good rain this last weekend. But uh, when that just kind of soaked on in, we should throughout the fall here, make sure our evergreens stay well hydrated. And some research has shown that um, 
a consistent water supply is better than just one a shot right before freeze up. For example, if if we if we get a dry spell throughout the month of October, uh, we should maybe water those evergreens, you know, rather than just giving it one hit right uh, before soil freezes, if you follow me. So to keep them well hydrated. And a good time in the fall to add mulch around our trees. Uh, if you notice that tree that has the mulch around, uh, it's, it's crowned a little bit high. Uh, so that's maybe not the best example. The mulch should be kept away from the trunk about five inches. So the, the roll, uh, rule is a good one, five, five, five. Uh, a five foot diameter circle of shredded wood material about five inches thick because it's gonna settle down and then kept about five inches away from the trunk in kind of a, a more of a donut shape than a volcano shape, if you can picture that. And a good time to add uh, trunk guards to wrap the tree trunks, uh, especially of young trees, so that it protects them from uh, rabbits and voles and deer. So especially young trees. We'll talk about fruit trees in a minute too, the importance of that. And of course, fence for rabbits. Um, we, we could go probably a whole hour on how to protect against rabbits. Uh, but it can basically be boiled down to fencing is the best. Uh, and there are several rabbit repellents that have better track records than others. One is liquid fence, one is plant skid, and another is repel X. Plant skid, liquid fence, and repel X. But like all repellents, they're not 100%. They're not going to work every time. All right, now about pruning. Uh, should we prune in the fall? I, I get many emails from people wondering, uh, is it too late? Did I miss, miss the time for fall pruning? Can I still prune? But uh, there's really not a good reason to prune trees, shrubs in the fall of the year. And, and here's why. Trees, trees and shrubs are smart. They sense these shortening days and because of the shortening days, it's a signal to them to start slowing down because they know that winter is coming and they need to kind of shut down. And so the cell division and growth starts to slow. So if we do pruning cuts in the fall, the cell division is slowing down. So cell division isn't going to seal over those pruning wounds the way it does uh, in early spring. So there's there's not really a good reason or advantage to prune in the fall of the year. You know, certainly if a shrub is hanging over the sidewalk and the snowblower is going to catch it, yeah, absolutely go ahead and prune it. Um, if you do prune in the fall or if you have in the past, it doesn't mean that that tree or shrub is going to die, but there's more risk of something going wrong by having those open wounds all winter. Maybe it's more branch die back. Again, it may just be totally fine, but it opens the way for something going wrong and there's really no advantage. A better is to wait until early spring, kind of right before things start to leaf out. And at that time, the pruning cuts will made and then shortly growth will start. The cells will start dividing and sealing over those pruning cuts. And uh, I should mention also, if you notice the photo on the lower right-hand side, a, a better way for pruning most of our shrubs is instead of a, a shearing type pruning, a kind of a selective cutting. If you'd like kind of a natural look on a shrub, uh, a selective cutting gives uh, just kind of a more natural look uh, part of nature. Um, unless you have a reason for shearing, uh, you know, unless uh, unless you're making a statement of some sort, uh, then of course, if you're making a topiary area in which you need to uh, sh uh, shear, then of course, I've often thought uh, um, this this slide makes the gardening rounds every so often, and there's got to be a story there somewhere. All right, next we're going on to roses. Now, I, I love the hardy Canadian developed roses because they really don't require uh, much care. They're 
winter hardy, so they'll usually survive fine. Sometimes a little bit of die back up at the top, but roses like pruning anyway in the spring. So I love the hardy Canadian type. But if a person has some of the less hardy, tender types, then they do benefit from covering. And again, uh, pruning on roses is best delayed until next spring, unless you have a reason why you need to prune them. For example, if you have a less hardy rose type and you want to do some protection uh, with like a circle of leaves. Oh, by the way, the rose cones themselves, the styrofoam rose, rose cones aren't usually enough. Uh, you need to kind of pack them with leaves or straw in addition to just the styrofoam. Otherwise, there's too much cold air right around the canes. Uh, but leaves work very well. And so if you need to do some protection on them, then maybe you do need to prune. But if it's one of the winter hardy types, uh, then they're best left unpruned and do that pruning in early spring. Also, there's been some interesting uh, research done that um, that roses tend to winter better if the hips are left on. Everybody knows what the, what the hips are uh, on a rose when the blossoms fade if pollination has happened you get this little fruit almost looks like a little crab apple and actually crab apples are in the rose family and those are the rose hips and some research has shown that if those are left on uh, it kind of hardens off the rose bush toughens it up and gets it ready for winter so the last flush of roses rose blossoms and by the way some of my um uh, Mary and my roses, uh, some of the Canadian ones are still putting out nice flushes of fall bloom. And so that last flush of fall bloom, I always leave on based on that research that if that last flush is left on and if they get uh, some hips on them, that they'll survive winter better. And if you do need to cover some of the tender roses, then they should usually be covered about early November. Uh, not wise to do it too early because roses are kind of notorious for hanging on to their, their own foliage. And if we cover them with leaves or something else while they still have that foliage on, they'll oftentimes mold under that covering. So it's better to delay covering until early November and by that time, the leaves will have gotten some cold weather. They hopefully will drop. And yet we haven't gotten severe temperatures yet. And of course, fence for rabbits. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Rabbits are interesting creatures. Uh, roses, they just love. And I, I would think that something with that many thorns along the canes would be the last thing that rabbits would eat, but, but they do love it. And I guess it makes sense because the roses Rose are in the same as fruit, uh, fruit trees, and we all know that rabbits love our fruit trees. So let's head on into fruit trees. So it's important in the fall of the year to rake up any of the fallen fruits. Now, usually with most apple trees, you will get some that drop, some of it's natural fruit drop, or maybe they were uh, apples that had defection and kind of defects on, or maybe the wasps or hornets got into them and then they drop and create kind of a litter on the, on the ground. Well, it's important to rake that up for good sanitation because some of our common uh, fruit insects will winter. Uh, they can pass from the apple down into the ground and it just makes a, it, it makes a more likely, uh, a more likely way that um, these problems, insects and disease, will resurrect if we if we don't practice good sanitation. So important to rake away the leaves and the uh, to rake the leaves and the um, and the fallen fruit. And wrapping the tree trunks very important. Fruit trees uh, are very susceptible to winter sun scald, and what happens with a winter sun scald is on a snowy day when we get bright sun uh, sunshine reflecting off the snow, uh, you know, on those bright winter days, um, the same way that a skier can get a sunburn on a sunny, snowy winter day. Uh, fruit trees can get sun scald. Usually it happens on the south or southwest 
of the tree trunk where that sun is reflecting off the snow and up onto the tree trunk and it can cause a a warming of that tree trunk which then of course freezes again and ruptures and causes problems and so the way to eliminate that or or at least reduce the risk is to wrap the tree trunks and uh, wrapping the tree trunks should continue from the time the trees are young until the bark is more a rough. If you notice the oldest older apple tree there in the photo, um, the one with the apples underneath, uh, the bark is quite rough and rigid and gray. And so an older apple tree then normally is not wrapped. The type of wrap that I like the best is the one photoed there. It's a uh, kind of a burlap material or garden center cell other materials that come in rolls and you fasten the bottom, fasten the base, uh, with something like duct tape, and then uh, spiral it up the trunk, overlapping it, and then either tie at the top or use a masking tape or duct tape at the top. What I like about the rolls of wrapping like that, instead of the tree tubes, you know, the white type tree tube, uh, these, that wrap, is able to go all the way up the trunk and you can intertwine it among kind of some of the uh, upper branches that kind of bring, uh, you know, branch down to the trunk, if you follow me, you can kind of go higher than what a tree tube would allow you to do. And so I really like those tree wraps. So they should be applied in October or by early November, and then they should be removed next April. Uh, removing the tree wraps for the spring and summer and early fall allows that tree trunk to breathe. There's less chance of rot or insects hiding behind the wrapping. And of course, fence from pests. Uh, boy, we had a lot of injury, didn't we, on apple trees uh, this past winter because the snow banks got high enough so that the rabbits could get up into the upper branches of a tree and, uh, and do a lot of damage. And so for many people that had fenced maybe three feet high, maybe four feet, it just wasn't high enough. And of course, that's not always a winter problem. Uh, sometimes our three or four foot fence will keep them away from the trunk. Uh, you could try the repellents, um, liquid fence, plant skid, or repellix. You could try those or um, be prepared if winter gets uh, really snowy again. Uh, some of us have even been known to tramp out through the snow drifts and put an extra layer of fencing out around. All right, next we're going to move to the annual flower beds. Uh, we could save seeds of some of the non-hybrid type flowers, some of the marigolds. Uh, Cleome is a great one I enjoy saving seed from, some of the zinnias. And so the non-hybrid seeds come quite nicely true from seed the following year. And so that's fun to save some of your own seeds uh, by collecting them. And of course, the tender flower bulbs, those that aren't winter hardy enough to uh, to survive over winter, those need to be dug about the time of the first frost. Uh, you can let a little bit of frost get on them, that's fine. Um, things like gladiolus dal dahlia cannas are probably the most common. So those get dug up and stored. In And last, uh, last week's seminar, we, um, we talked about those in more detail. All right, and we can clean up the annual flower beds. Uh, you can either rake off the old annuals. If they're clean and free of disease, then those can be just worked on into the flower bed. Uh, what I do on our annual flower beds, I simply uh, go over them with the mower. After the frost has kind of dried up the tops, um, I simply go over them with a lawnmower, crunch them up really good, and then rototill them back into the soil. Again, only if they were disease-free. A good time to add organic material to our flower gardens and work that on in. Then it'll be all ready to go. And of course, this, this was an organic method of fertilizing raised gardens, but the method just never caught on. All right, next we go to perennial flowers. 
Now, some of the perennial flowers uh, like to be divided in the fall. This is their time to be divided in September. And even though it's the 26th, uh, we're getting kind of on the edge of that time, but we could still do it. For example, there are some uh, daylilies um, that I, I, I want to move and divide, uh, some iris yet that I want to do. And so even the preferred time was probably maybe towards Labor Day, we can still do this. Uh, if a person does have to uh, dig and divide a little bit later, maybe than the recommended. Here, here's a good way to, here's a good way to make sure it's going to work out. Okay, uh, go ahead and dig, divide, uh, even if it starts getting into first of October. But put a good layer of mulch. And when I say a good layer of mulch, put at least five or six inches of straw, uh, leaves. Um, could be shredded wood product. Put that around the perennial that you just divided and planted. What that will do, that will insulate the ground so that frost won't penetrate as quickly. So that will buy you more warm soil time for that perennial to get accustomed and do what they do in the fall of the year. And usually what they're doing is producing some roots yet in the fall of the year. So you can buy time by putting probably a three foot diameter circle of a mulching type material insulating and that will give you a little bit of time. And of course, the fall is time to plant our beautiful bulbs that will come up next spring and give us such beauty. You know, it's interesting. In the spring of the year, when you see tulips blooming, many of us wish, gosh, I wish I had planted more of those in the fall. And so now is the time to visit the garden centers and to actually do it. I, I wanna get some more tulips for our own flower beds because they're so pretty in the spring. And uh, so now is a good time. If by any chance you're planting them a little bit late, um, for example, when you plant bulbs like tulip bulbs, they aren't just sitting dormant now in the fall. They aren't just sitting dormant under the soil. What they're doing is producing roots. And it's those roots that are going to uh, cause it to burst into growth next spring. So we need to give those bulbs rooting time before the soil freezes. So if you're a little bit late planting tulips or other bulbs, again, do the mulching thing. You know, put anywhere from maybe six inches or more of a good mulch over that planting bed that will keep the soil warmer and buy you an extra two, three, four weeks of unfrozen soil. So some of those things we can kind of work with that even though if we are maybe a little late getting some things done at times, uh, we can make them work for us. And in the perennial garden, uh, most perennials love organic matter, whether it's compost, peat moss, uh, other organic material, just kind of worked in around it. Most perennials really benefit from that. So the fall of the year is a good time to add that. And most perennials, uh, most perennials benefit from having the tops left on over winter. Now, someday I'm going to write a garden book because I love some of the terminology that uh, some of the terminology that gardeners use. And so it'd be fun to write a whole book of gardening terminology. Okay, here, here's a classic one. The tops of perennials. Okay, um, think about it. The top of a building is, well, up at the top. But the tops of perennials is everything above ground level. And so when you hear somebody say, oh, it's time to cut back the tops of perennials, it's not just up the very topmost, it's everything basically from ground level on up, maybe an inch or two above ground level. So when you read uh, and say, you know, it's time to cut back the tops, now you'll know you're not just trimming way up here, you're doing doing everything. Okay, most perennials, the tops, are left intact over winter. And here's why. Uh, well, for one thing, they're pretty. Uh, look at that winter scene. It, it's fun to, I, I wish this were my winter scene, uh, but it's fun to look out the window at a landscape, a perennial garden, and notice in that photo, the ornamental grasses with their seed heads and kind of the frosty perennials and shrubs. It, it's pretty. It's a nice landscape. And so leaving those tops on is pretty. And uh, it will give some habitat for birds as they pick away at the seeds. Uh, also, um, very importantly, most perennials 
uh, tend to survive winter better if those tops are left intact. Uh, because if we have an, and one of these winters, we're going to get a test winter when we don't get much snow to insulate and we get really frigid temperatures. And those are conditions in which even hardy perennials can be lost. But if we leave the tops intact, what little snow we do have tends to accumulate and catch on those. So they tend to winter better. Now, um, many good successful perennial gardeners in the fall of the year go in and cut back the tops and that's fine. Uh, you know, that, that works good too. If the time is better for you to get things cleaned up in the fall, it doesn't mean they're going to automatically die over winter. So, um, but there, there are, again, there are advantages to leaving them on. Uh, oh, one other advantage too is our little pollinator friends, our native bees that we need for our apples and cucumbers and everything. Many of those native bees nest over winter in the hollow stems of perennials and ornamental grasses. So by leaving the tops on, we're providing some nesting material for the little pollinating bees. Um, although there are a couple of varieties of, of perennials, <coughs> excuse me, a couple of varieties of perennials that even if you decide to leave most everything intact, there are a couple of varieties of perennials that should always be cut back. One of those is peony because they usually get that grayish powdery mildew and cutting off the tops about an inch above ground level and disposing of those in the trash and off-site helps prevent that powdery mildew from laying there and reinfecting the soil. Also, daylily, iris, and hosta. Uh, they become so limp after a couple of frosts. And by next spring under snow, what you get is kind of a, a, a mushy mess and trying to cut back. So they're much easier to cut back in the fall of the year after a few frosts. And then if you do have any kind of borderline perennials, um, well, for example, the perennial hibiscus with the great big blossoms, it's a little borderline in hardiness. Uh, that might be a good one to mulch if you've got some borderline perennials. Okay, very quickly, outdoor containers. Uh, it's best to remove the old plants so that next spring you don't come in and find all those kind of um, frozen uh, slimy plants that were left in. So removing the old plants is good sanitation. Can we reuse the potting mix? Absolutely, yes. Mary and I have used the same potting mix in some of the pots for probably going on seven or eight years. Um, but uh, it's important to start with a high quality potting mix and one that has good drainage and good peat moss and all the good things. Uh, and um, just make sure that none of your plants were diseased in that. And each year in the spring, you should maybe remove about one fourth of the potting mix and add new, add fresh. And also I should mention, if you have a breakable type container, a ceramic, that freezing and thawing of that soil could crack it, then by all means, remove the planting mix. And uh, last week in our webinar, we talked all about bringing container plants indoors, uh, geraniums, mandevilla, uh, hibiscus. One of our favorites for bringing in is geraniums. What we do is uh, the center photo there, we uh, lift the geraniums up out of the potting mix, uh, cut them back, the lower right-hand photo, cut them all the way back, pot them up in a little square pot, put them under lights in the basement, and you've got, by next May, greenhouse quality geraniums again. Okay, real quickly about houseplants in the, um, in the fall here on these good days, uh, warm days, great time to repot outdoors, and uh, much easier to do it outdoors than on the kitchen table. Also, a uh, good time to buy uh, house plants before the weather turns cold. It's a lot easier to transport them now than it is in January when they have to be wrapped so carefully. And we might treat our uh, plants with systemic insecticide that goes internally throughout to control insects. And for fungus gnats, those little annoying flies that uh, that want to um, uh, kind of flit around all of our house plants. 
um, called fungus gnats. There's a good way to control those. And that's with the product called mosquito bits that you see there in the red, uh, red and yellow labeled uh, package. Now, garden centers and some of the hardware stores sell mosquito bits. And if you look right under on the front of the label, it says also controls fungus gnats. Now, the way it controls fungus gnats is it controls the larvae. You see the little flies lay eggs on the soil, the eggs hatch into larvae, the larvae turn into adult flies, and they form a life cycle all inside your houseplant soil. So these mosquito bits have a, a beneficial bacteria uh, that does not harm humans, excuse me, um, it only affects larvae of mosquitoes and fungus gnats. And so it, it takes a little bit of time for this bacteria to uh, uh, get kind of through the soil and then it will kill those fungus gnat larvae and it breaks the life cycle. Uh, I just wanna tell you quickly about if you uh, haven't seen our Growing Together podcast, uh, do a search for Growing Together Gardening Podcast. Uh, John Lamb from the Forum and I enjoy a weekly podcast talking about gardening. And I want to thank you uh, for joining us. And I'm going to leave my email address on the screen. And so please do, uh, please do feel free to email me. All right. And now let's, uh, let's go to the Let's go to the questions. All right, uh, the first question is, is dormant planting appropriate for the planting of clover in the lawn? Instructions indicate no planting six weeks before hard frost. Okay, and the reason for clover uh, not planting six weeks before hard frost would be uh, the clover needs a certain length of time to establish. So if it's planted, uh, kind of too, if, if it's planted too late without enough time to establish, it could freeze out. But you could do the dormant seeding type. So wait until right before a, uh, a snowfall that's expected to say, stay similar to what, what we did with the grass and then do the dormant seeding of clover. That can work very effectively. So I, I wouldn't plant the clover now. I would wait and dormant seed. Uh, thoughts on replacing grass with micro -clo clover. Micro clover is a very little fine uh, clover, uh, similar to the white Dutch clover that has a little larger leaf. But both the micro clover, which is kind of a finer little clover, uh, or the white Dutch clover uh, are great additions to lawns. In fact, it's interesting. In the 1940s and 50s, uh, premium lawns, uh, the lawns of the well-kept and well-to-do always had clover incorporated. Uh, it was considered an elite lawn if you had clover in it because there's a lot to be said for clover in a lawn. It feeds uh, nitrogen down into the soil and, and uh, it, it um, roots deeply and kind of breaks up the soil so that grass uh, can thrive. So grass and clover blend together really well. So I'm, I'm a big fan of incorporating clover into a lawn. Okay, I have two young autumn maples with leaves covered with little black seed-like pods. Can I save the trees? Okay, on maples, if they develop uh, little growths uh, described as black seed-like pods, they've probably turned black. But earlier in the season, those growths on maple leaves are galls. They're called maple leaf gall. And they usually start out green or maybe reddish. And they're caused by a little mite. And the mite encloses itself inside tissue and builds this kind of little wall all around. Uh, the nice thing is that it's been shown that they it doesn't adversely affect uh, the maple trees. Uh, younger maple trees, uh, we see it. We see it happening and it it, it alarms us, but it's it's cosmetic. On a big maple tree, you'll never even know they're there. Uh, the maples coexist fine with it. If if over half of the leaf was covered by these bumps, these galls, then maybe it could have an effect. Uh, but if it's just a few of them, 
then it's no problem. But again, it's they're probably turning black now as those little galls uh, approach uh, uh, approach um, fall and winter. Uh, when do you pull all the things in your garden? Uh, when do you pull all the things? The the disease type materials such as uh, probably tomatoes, potato vines, cucumber vines that had um, the uh, the powdery mildew. As soon as you're done harvesting those, I think it's a good idea to get those off. If it's uh, non-diseased material, then it's probably a good idea just to work that on in. So I don't uh, I don't clear cut our garden. I remove and pull off the things that were diseased or disease prone and then work the other material on in. And uh, the material that I let work on in, I usually wait until after we've had some frost. Can tubes be left on trees all year to protect from animals? Well, luckily, uh, luckily animals tend to leave, not in all cases, but animals tend to leave our tree trunks alone in summertime because they've got other better things to chew on. An exception might be deer, uh, young bucks that might be rubbing their antlers on. Um, but tree tubes generally should be taken off. There's more risk of leaving them on because they can be areas where mold and insects will hide under that tree wrap. So, um, so again, it's in most cases, the tree tubes should be taken off. Uh, we were among the snow trompers, adding more fencing to the trees. Yes, absolutely. I'm kind of hoping for just a medium snow year, enough to insulate, but not so much that we have to snow blow every other day. How do you know when a watermelon is ripe? Uh, I, love, I love growing watermelon. Okay, a couple of ways to tell a ripe watermelon. One is the ground spot, which is the spot on which the watermelon was resting on the ground, turns from a white or cream to more of a yellowish. Okay, and the, the things that I'm going to describe, you put all these clues together and then determine that a watermelon is ripe. Okay, so the ground spot turning yellow. Uh, the next is that if you watch the watermelons during the season as they enlarge, a ripe watermelon loses the shininess and becomes a little duller in color on the rind, kind of a less waxy, less glossy. Okay. Then the next one is take a look at the stem end where it's attached to the vine. There are two little wire like tendrils. When those turn brown and crisp, the watermelon is approaching ripeness, but not necessarily yet. Take a look at the leaf. There's a little leaf right by those tendrils and wait for that to get crispy brown. And then the other thing that I love to do too is give it the thump test. And when you plunk a watermelon using your uh, middle finger and thumb and give it a plunk, it should sound kind of like a rubber filled water ball. Or my uh, vegetable teacher in college said, thump the top of a leather shoe with your foot in it. And a ripe watermelon sounds like that. Or thump the watermelon as it's growing during the season. And you'll hear, you'll hear the, the change in tone. You'll, you'll feel that, uh, that dull plunk of a water-filled melon. So anyway, a long, long answer, but boy, there's nothing more disgusting than growing a watermelon all season and then go to pick it and cut it and they don't ripen off the vine, cut it and find out it's still too pink inside. When is the best time to cut down my peonies? After a couple of frosts. Let the frosts happen because some things are still moving down from the leaves into the roots. So let a couple of frosts happen and then cut off an inch or two above um, above ground level. Have you heard about using paraurinal blocks around the base of trees and shrubs to ward off rodents during the winter months? You know, um, those do have quite an odor and many of the repellents do work on an odor based. Uh, liquid fence, plant skid and repellix all kind of are odor based. And uh, I think that's probably worth a try. So uh, yes, I have heard of that. Uh, so um, urinal blocks. How do you know if your plants are diseased? 
Ah, okay. That's a good question. Yeah. How do you know if the plants are diseased and you should be taking them off and disposing of them? Well, one of the classics is the gray powdery mildew on our vine crops, such as cucumbers. And you can see that uh, grayish whitish coating. So that's one that should be taken off. Um, tomatoes oftentimes get uh, black or brown spots or speckles on the leaves. And that's a good indication that they've got a fungus disease present. Maybe it didn't totally kill it, but it can diminish them. So those could be raked off. Uh, potato vines oftentimes uh, can be very susceptible to the different blights. And so those can be taken off. So those are kind of the classics, the vine crops, potatoes, tomatoes, and peas. I missed the houseplant webinar. Is it recorded? It is recorded. Uh, and I could send it out to everyone that uh, registered for this webinar. Uh, but I got kind of busy and I haven't had time to edit the recording yet. But I can send it out. Uh, thanks for joining from Superior, Wisconsin. Thanks. Uh, what should I do for wintering morning glory? Uh, wintering morning glory. Now, morning glory with the kind of a nice blue trumpet shaped flowers uh, seeds itself each year. That's an annual vine that comes back from seed and the flowers drop seed. And so once you get morning glory started on a fence, it will usually come back each year from the seed that it deposited itself sowed itself. So uh, there's no, usually not anything else. So um, if we're talking about that same morning glory vine with the nice blue trumpet shaped blossoms, sometimes there's a pink variety too. Uh, they'll self seed. Uh, so you don't really need to do anything extra. Uh, yeah, isn't that mosquito bits a good product to use uh, on houseplants? But again, give it a little time to work. When to stop mulching versus bagging before the end of the season? Is it better to ever bag mulch prior to freeze up? Uh, well, if we talk about bagging on lawnmower, usually uh, bagging isn't really needed or recommended. Uh, by not bagging, you can just let the clippings fall back into the lawn and they'll filter down in and provide nutrition and things for the lawn. And so you, can, you don't need to bag lawn clippings and so uh, is it better to ever bag mulch prior to freeze up? One of the reasons for bagging uh, when you're mowing and like if you're mulching up leaves, one of the reasons for bagging would be if you have so many leaves there that they wouldn't filter down in. And then yes, before freeze up or even uh, when those leaves would ac accumulate on the lawn, it would be better to bag them up. So I, ho I hope that answers. Should I cut my lamb's ear this fall? Lamb's ears are pretty, such a descriptive. Uh, those gray, uh, kind of silvery, whitish gray leaves are so fuzzy and beautiful. Should I cut my lamb's ear this fall? Uh, by next uh, spring, under the, um, under the snow, they usually kind of just kind of mat down, but I do think it's easier to cut them back next spring. I found that next spring, they almost just, you can almost just by hand take and kind of drag off the material off of the lambs here. So I, I act, you could cut them back this fall, but I find they're actually maybe a little easier to pull off in the spring of the year. Either can work. Is there herbicide recommended for using on creeping Charlie in the fall? Creeping Charlie being one of the hard to kill. And so, yes, yeah, search for a lawn herbicide. Uh, don't mention if this is in the lawn or not, but creeping Charlie often is. So um, look for a lawn weed herbicide containing the active ingredient triclopyr. T-R-I-C-L-O-P-Y-R, triclopyr. Uh, another one that uh, has a little more kick to it than just regular lawn herbicide would be Trimac. Both of those products, Trimac or one containing triclopyr, need to be used with caution uh, because if you got it too close to trees, shrubs, or non-grass plants, it could damage them as well. Remind us again when... And where do we find your podcast? Okay, the podcast is called Growing to Yeah, thanks for asking. Uh, it's called Growing Together a Gardening Podcast. 
and uh, you don't have to subscribe or anything like that. If you just do an internet search for Growing Together, a gardening podcast, it will pop up. Um, and there are different venues such as Spotify or YouTube. Uh, it will usually pop up on one of the things on your phone or computer that allows you to listen. And uh, they're all archived. It's all, all the weeks there. I think we've been doing it about nine months already. Uh, how do you know when to pull garlic? Is it the same as onions? Ah, in, interesting that you should ask. That's one thing I could have added into our program. Now is the time to plant garlic. Garlic is kind of unusual in that it gets fall planted and then you harvest it next growing season. Uh, okay, you plant it now, uh, maybe give it a mulch of uh, four to six inches or leaves and then uncover that next spring. It'll grow next spring and summer. And then when it starts to die down uh, next year, then you harvest the garlic. Uh, so unlike onions, which are spring planted, garlic is planted in the fall and harvested next year. So garden centers usually do have garlic available right now for planting. The leaves of my laurel leaf willow have blackened around the edges. What, what might be the cause? Uh, laurel leaf willow... Um, Laurel leaf willow, of course, being in the willow family, likes it moist. And so uh, these past three years haven't been really friendly to anything that likes moisture. Um, but even if it is getting enough water, one thing we can't control is the heat. And willows and some other things have had problems, uh, leaf scorch, uh, through the, from the heat. Sometimes they just can't pump up water enough to, uh, to get to the leaves and we get a scorched edge. And uh, so that could be what's happening with the laurel willow, which is a beautiful tree. And um, there are different leaf diseases that it could be, but generally there's probably no control uh, for anything that's causing that. So let's hope that next year we don't have it. And, but I, I'm thinking it's probably the heat stress. What do you recommend for apple blight? Uh, apple blight, well, there's a couple of things. Uh, apple blight could, uh, could um, refer to fire blight. And there are some fire blight sprays that garden centers sell. Um, but also we have to be very careful with pruning and do that dor during the dormant season uh, to prevent spreading fire blight. But if it's, um, if it's the blight that turns the leaves uh, spotted or yellow, uh, that's a disease called apple scab, which is a fungus disease. And there are fungus uh, sprays. Uh, there are home orchard sprays that have insecticide and fungicides in. So if you're finding black spots or yellowing leaves, then apple scab and a home orchard spray would control that. Uh, thank you for your kind words. Uh, when is the best time to cut down ornamental grasses? Next spring, before they start sending out any new growth, because uh, if they start sending out new growth and you have the old top on yet, it, it uh, the two get intertwined and it's hard to cut the old back. And if you don't cut ornamental grasses back once a year, you get this just this massive amount of dry material that can hamper the new growth. So next spring, well, probably April or so on a nice day, cut the ornamental grass back to about an inch above ground level. And then the new grass will push right through in May time. Um, reason for not cutting it back in the fall is because they're so pretty against the winter landscape. Uh, let's see, when should I cut hosta back? Uh, from Botno. Thanks for listening from Botno. Hosta uh, can be cut back in the fall after a frost or two uh, because by next spring laying under the snow they get just so mushy and so it's easier to cut them back in the fall and they really don't contribute much over winter. I've heard that it's best to stop harvesting rhubarb in July. Am I harming the plant if I harvest beyond that? Um, yeah, the cutoff date the recommended cutoff date for harvesting rhubarb and asparagus is July 1st. And here's the reason. Uh, rhubarb lets us pluck off all its stems and leaves the first half of the growing season. And the second half of the growing season 
it needs to keep its leaves so it can do its photosynthesis thing and kind of recharge itself from us having plucked everything off the first half of the growing season. So letting the uh, leaving the plant alone and not harvesting gives it that chance to recover. Uh, but in the fall of the year, you can certainly do a little harvesting if your plant still looks good. You can still do some harvesting for a rhubarb pie. Uh, now in the fall of the year, um, or in the spring of the year, frost is oftentimes a question. Uh, does frost cause rhubarb to be poisonous? Uh, the reason we don't eat rhubarb leaves is because the leaves are toxic. And if after a rhubarb plant is frosted, some of that toxin could move down into the stalks, which wouldn't be good. Uh, so here's how you tell. If after a frost, either fall or spring, if the rhubarb leaves are wilted, don't use it. If the stalks are wilted, don't use it. If it looks like that rhubarb was totally unaffected by frost, then it's safe to use. And so anyway, I hope that answers the question as to generally the last half of summer, uh, we don't harvest rhubarb. Uh, but if you need to sneak some for a pie before the season ends, uh, it's, it's certainly fine. When is the best time to transplant Juneberry bushes? That would be early spring before uh, they leaf out. That would be best. You know, if you have no option, then in the fall of the year here, maybe after they get a frost or so and have kind of hardened off and shut down more dormant, then you could go ahead and move. But if, if, uh, if you have your choice, then move a Juneberry or any other woody type tree or shrub, move it in early spring when it's dormant before it starts leafing out. Okay, why would ears of corn not fully form? Uh, when ears of corn don't fully form, and I think we're on the last question, uh, when ears of corn don't fully form, oh, we might have a few more in the Q&A beside the chat. I'll get to those. Um, uh, why would ears of corn not fully form? That's all about pollination. Each of the those silk, silky hairs that form up at the top of the ear, each of those leads to a kernel. Uh, that's where the pollen goes down and forms the little kernels that we eat. And if pollination doesn't happen or doesn't happen right, and then you, so you miss all these kernels. And so ears that don't fully form is usually a pollination problem. And uh, corn is generally mostly wind pollinated, which is why we kind of plant it in blocks so that when the wind blows it, it will pollinate. And um, so if pollen doesn't work and it, it can fail to work because if the temperature is too high, temperature too low, uh, then it can be uh, poor pollination. I need to... Uh, I need to move a young apple tree to a better location. When is the best time to do so? And uh, yeah, thanks for enjoying our podcast. Um, the best time to move a young apple tree would be in early spring before it leaves out. Again, if you're moving or something, want to take an apple tree with you, then certainly, you know, but it carries a little more risk doing something, moving a plant um, such as a woody plant. Uh, you could move perennials and things, etc. But a woody plant would be better moved in the spring so it didn't have to face a winter right away. Um, okay, what can be done in the fall to minimize vole damage to lawns? Yeah, and we've had a bad, uh, bad couple of years on vole damage. Uh, well, making sure that the lawn is trimmed in the fall of the year, cut it down to about two inches on the last mowing because vole damage tends to be worse uh, if the lawn is longer, you know, they'll still get it uh, if you trim low, but chances are less. And uh, the other thing is those voles are already lurking around the perimeters of our property. And so you could use traps, but put them in something uh, so kids or pets can't get them. Um, traps or poison baits. I like to use tubes of PVC, white PVC pipe. Uh, I put either traps or vo or um, rodent poison inside those so that pets or kids can't access them. The voles like to tunnel into things, and so oftentimes they'll go in those tubes uh, to get your trap or your poison. Uh, can we eat immature squash? Absolutely. 
you know, there's nothing uh, harmful with it, but it just, uh, a, a squash that isn't fully mature, fully ripe, just won't have the flavor or the quality, but uh, there would be nothing wrong with, with eating it. Have you uh, ever overwintered pepper plants? Uh, pepper plants, um, you know, conceivably you could bring in a pepper plant or a tomato plant. Those are both perennial plants in the tropics. And so the only reason they're not a perennial here, of course, is at the first frost, they die. And so you could bring a pepper plant indoors, a uh, sunny window or under lights. And um, I, I've seen people, I've not done that myself, but I have seen people that have done it successfully. So it'd be worth a try. You know, some of these things, a person doesn't have much to lose, be fun to try. What care does a clematis need in the fall? Now, uh, most clematis uh, die back each winter to about ground level. And so most of the clematis vine growth next spring comes from the ground level or slightly below ground level. So uh, you have a couple of choices. I like to leave our clematis vines on over winter because it gives me a little something to look at on the trellis. Uh, you could cut it back. Sometimes over winter, it'll just dry up. And I find that it's easier than the next spring to get it off of the trellis because it's become all dry and crunchy over winter. And it's just easier to kind of rub it and it just kind of falls off. In the fall of the year, it seems you have to kind of actually pull it off. And so I, I just feel it's a little easier in the spring of the year, but you could remove a clematis vine from the trellis in, in the fall. Uh, so what, what care does a clematis need in the fall? If it's a relatively young clematis, uh, less than three years, a good mulch, uh, and when I say good mulch, you know, 12 inches, 18 inches of leaves, straw, uh, would help it, especially if we don't get any snow cover. A clematis, once it's well-established, well-rooted, that will last decades and decades. But until they reach that good root system, they're a little more uh, sensitive to overwinter. So if it's a younger clematis, even if it's an older clematis, they, they enjoy mulch over their roots, but most, uh, most necessary when they're younger. Weed and feed worth doing? Uh, no. Uh, weed and feed actually uh, can be kind of a waste of ingredients. And here's why. Uh, the feed part... Definitely, that's needed. The weed part of a weed and feed are herbicide granules. And those granules, in most cases, are contact weed killers. They only kill weeds when that granule sticks to a dandelion leaf. They don't prevent weeds from popping up. And most of our lawns aren't a blanket of weeds. And so to blanket the lawn with a weed killer is kind of overdue, uh, you know, over overkill, I guess. And uh, those things can end up down our storm drains and in our rivers and streams. And so a better approach is a liquid herbicide, sep separate, uh, separate, uh, separate practices. So fertilize and then apply a, a liquid herbicide, liquid lawn weed killer and spot spray uh, is a really good effective. And so, yeah, I, I'm glad you asked that one because sometimes weed and feed sounds good in, in theory, but in practice, it, it kind of doesn't work so well. I get lots of emails about that. People saying, my weed and feed really didn't, didn't control the weeds that well. And uh, the main key is that uh, they aren't really preventative. Do we cut down our rhubarb plant in the fall? Yes, after a couple of frosts, the rhubarb plant is better uh, raked off and disposed of. And the reason for that is there are a couple of rhubarb foliage diseases that cause brown spots on both the stalks and the leaves. And removing that removes some of the inoculum that might be uh, a source of infection. I have a clematis that turned uh, leaves brown early August. It's never happened other years. Um, okay, one thing about clematis is they love coolness. In fact, uh, the old saying with clematis is they love their head in the sun and their feet in the shade. So they love mulch over the root zone and they don't like heat. Uh, a, a preferred 
location for clematis is on the east side of a building where they get morning sun and then they get shade protection from the heat of the afternoon sun. Uh, that's not always possible to give at that location. But anyway, uh, the reason the leaves probably turn brown is one of two things. Uh, they don't like heat and we had a hot summer, but also um, rabbits will gnaw on certain stems and then everything beyond that will die. So it's possibly something nibbled on a vine or two causing death above that point. Uh, the recording, I will send this out to all of you who registered. I'll send tonight's and last week's recording out. Uh, and Vicki has mulch made of cedar bark. How far away from perennials should the mulch be kept? Uh, when planted, uh, they didn't keep the mulch back. Um, perennials really can have the mulch put relatively close, close within an inch or two of the stems. The reason tree trunk mulch has to be kept away is because uh, it's possible for that tree trunk to start rotting if mulch is too close. But uh, most perennial stems don't have that uh, that rotting issue of the stems because the stems die back once a year anyway. So uh, the mulch can be put relatively close, you know, maybe within an inch or so of perennial stems. Uh, chlorosis, um, what do you recommend um, on iron chlorosis? Uh, especially in trees, lots of maple trees showed uh, this. Uh, we were told we had to drill holes. I, I, I'm thinking you're maybe told to drill holes in the lawn. Uh, drilling holes in the lawn, like under the canopy of a tree that's yellow, uh, drilling holes would allow the iron. And what you do is you go to a garden center and buy an iron product that they'll have uh, for treating these trees. You follow the directions. Uh, and holes will allow some of that to get down in, but the holes aren't necessary. You can apply that um, iron product uh, according to label directions, but then the key is water, uh, plenty of water or do it before a rain, uh, several inches of water over that area that you've applied it to get that down into the root system. So holes would not be absolutely necessary. I've had good results just putting it on the surface, but plenty of water to carry it down. How do you know the type of lawn seed to buy for an established lawn so that it matches the existing grass? Oh, that's a good question. Okay, most of our existing lawns are a high percentage of Kentucky bluegrass. Now there are different variety, uh, different cultivars of Kentucky bluegrass, and they can uh, vary a little bit in uh, darkness of green. Uh, but generally, if you get a grass seed that's very high, at least 50% in Kentucky bluegrass cultivars, over time, they will blend in. Um, when a new grass seed, even if it's not the exact cultivar of bluegrass, as long as it's a high uh, per uh, percentage of Kentucky bluegrass, such as over 50%, uh, over time, that new grass will get used to your fertilizer and your soil. And over maybe the first year it won't happen, but in the second and third growing seasons, they'll they'll blend together. Because uh, otherwise, it's almost impossible to know exactly which cultivar of Kentucky bluegrass might be on an existing lawn. Uh, I put the excess shredded leaves in my garden as mulch. How do I keep the shredded leaves in North Dakota winds? Yes. Um, yeah, and it's hard to keep them consistently wet enough so they don't blow around. That's why in our garden, when I use leaves, I, I incorporate them in. I rototill or spade them in a little bit so that they're already starting to decompose. If you're using them as a surface mulch, um, they need to kind of start getting wet or decomposing a little bit first. But if they're fresh leaves, they quickly dry out and uh, yeah, are long gone in the wind. What do you recommend uh, for dealing with voles? Okay, I think we got that one. Uh, how do you get rid of striped gophers in a lawn? Well, there are different gopher repellents that you can try, but I think they're kind of hit and miss. So um, uh, striped gophers in a lawn, uh, the most sure way is to do some checking on gopher traps. 
is probably the, the needle. And now I see we're at the end of our questions. Well, thank you to the 61 of you who uh, hung on. We had, I, I believe, about uh, 90, 93 or so when I looked uh, that attended. And thank you for the, the rest of you that uh, a nice proportion of you uh, hung on to the bitter end. And so anyway, thank you very much. Um, I'll probably do another webinar maybe in the middle of October. I thought it'd be fun to do something on how to propagate houseplants uh, when we start turning our attention more indoors. So uh, maybe the middle or the end of October. And what I do is with everyone who has registered for these webinars, I usually send out the registration form for upcoming videos and webinars as well. So thank you very much. I appreciate very much and enjoy the fall. And I'm actually going to be taking a day or so or part partial days off because I'm going to get some of our own fall work done. And it looks like the weather's going to be nice. And so I'll be joining uh, many of the rest of you with getting our tasks done. So thank you again. Thanks for joining. Have a very good fall. Thank you much. Thank you.